What? How when are you going to endorse me back on LinkedIn? I'm not endorsing Because I've endorsed you for every single skill in your oh, profile. Yeah, well. and so. Oh dear. I feel like we should have some like. You're not endorsing me for anything. When, when they start to show it, endorse. Well, when I get something that sort of comes and says, oh, endorse these guys, I might do that. But One. to be more serious, how many of you got LinkedIn profiles? Would you be interested if we created a school of computing at Derby LinkedIn yeah, group? group? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Group, group, group. Yep, we'll get one for you yeah. quite soon. Okay, lovely. Yeah. We'll be like, yeah. Yeah. Coming soon to University of Derby, 2018. <laughs> That's when I uh, graduated. Yeah, terms and conditions may apply. This may not be the final date of the. This isn't the material that we. We're in two at the moment. So, one of the f interesting things about IT, and that link I sent out this morning to you, circulated this morning, shows that it's not just IT, but it's a much broader, let me just switch this right out for a little while, a much broader problem, it's across almost every significant industry, that there are really serious problems about delivering projects on time to budget uh, and with the sort of quality that the customers are kind of expecting. But to start with, I want to look at consequences of failure of governance. And it's probably quite useful to start at what's been in the press these last three, four days, which is VW. VW. That, why is that a failure of governance? Why should I claim that's a failure of governance? I thought it was to do with uh, what they uh, what they tell the consumer, what, so who's actually purchasing the vehicle, but surely they're accountable. They're mis-selling information to them. Mis-selling, telling lies, being unethical, finding loopholes in mm -hmm. the test regime, and, and so on. <clears throat> But what they did is essentially no difference to, different to what happened with the LIBOR scandal, which is the interest rate uh, fixing scandal, or the foreign ex exchange problems that the banks have had. It's no different from the credit crunch from the, uh, those mortgages that were building up from sort of 2000 through 2008. It's no different to what happened when Ford released the Pinto back in the 60s, I think it was, knowing at launch day that there was a serious problem with the Pinto, that if it had a rear end crash, petrol would come from a tank, shower the whole of all of the passengers and potentially incinerate them. And they, the world fe fell in really thoroughly when a letter or an mem internal memo report was re um, leaked by one of the Ford accountants with the details of the cost-benefit analysis of fixing the problem or leaving it. And it's basically assigned a cost or value to the number of people who would be killed and incinerated and the legal claims on them versus the cost of fixing the problem. <laughs> it's also kind of related in a different way to the ethics. I mean, it, VW and Ford and all these other ones relate very strongly to corporate ethics. The relationship between what the corporation thinks is okay and that clash with the personal morality that we have about good and evil or doing the right thing, doing the wrong thing, and cheating. And you know, for whatever, however much you sort of like or dislike, say, uh, Jeremy Clarkson, his article yesterday in the Sunday Times was saying, well, you know, what they did was only what we all do when we kind of adjust our CV slightly to sort of puff up some things. They were just puffing up the credentials of the, the good credentials of the uh, diesel engines they were producing and making sure they met the, the requirement at the point in time it's been tested and then, oh dear, it's a bit too difficult. It, it reduces the experience of the user driving a diesel engine if it really meets the criteria all the time, it's not going to be quite as powerful, it's not going to be as smooth, and, and, and. So that's one perspective. The other perspective, of course, is that, and we'll come across this later on in, another, in a two or three weeks' time, that in law, in the UK and many other countries, the directors have responsibilities 
in law, and it's Article 174, I think, in the 2006 Companies Act in the UK, thereabouts, which identifies the responsibilities of the directors of a company in law. And it starts off with not the shareholder. The shareholder, which every director you ever ask will say, if you ask them a question, to whom are you guys responsible, they will always say the shareholder. In fact, the shareholder comes at the very end of a list of six or eight different sort of people. The first one, or first or second, is to consider and bear in mind the interests of the employees. And then at the very end of the list are the shareholders. And then in the middle you've got people like the government and society. And so in this sense, although VW don't happen to be a UK company, um, but in principle if we had say Vauxhall or one of the UK companies doing something like this, then no, in terms of their responsibilities to the government and to society, meeting emissions targets is kind of part of their legal remit. So they can be, I think they can be caught in a whole range of interesting directions. Now, the CBR article, or articles on the website, is quite interesting because when that, I produced that list in just two weeks, I found that whole list of articles in uh, CBR which pointed to failures in one way or another of corporate governance and information governance. Uh, there's an article there about a company called um, Knight Capital, who were one of these high frequency trading companies back about two, three years ago, who introduced, and they, they use very 